Um, in the interest, uh, we've got a very full agenda. Uh, the clock is ticking and we seem to be still awaiting. Um, has the representative from Colombia uh, come yet? Camila. Camila, ah, uh, que bien. Do you have a presentation? Yes, it's already in the computer. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. Well, it's my uh, great, great honor to uh, be starting this, this uh, session today, uh, which will be a high-level side event on the impact of climate change on mountain areas, a priority for global action. And um, I'm going to provide some initial framing remarks, and then we've got a very interesting panel, which will be giving broad perspectives on mountain issues uh, around the world. I'm going to run a fairly tight ship here because we've got a very full agenda and actually very little time to work through all of the different topics that we need to get through today. So by way of initial introduction, I'm Dr. Andrew Tabor, and I'm the executive director of the Mountain Institute, which is an environmental NGO that works around the world to conserve mountain ecosystems. But I'm also the chair of the steering committee of the Mountain Partnership. This is a UN Type 2 alliance with a membership of about 57 countries and uh, over 200 other organizations that works together to advance sustainable mountain development, <coughs> including climate change adaptation and mitigation. I thank the, the pool of panelists. I thank all of you for coming. And I particularly thank the Secretariat at FAO for organizing this event. And I wanted to say that in addition tomorrow, there's going to be two uh, events on mountains in the green zone uh, one starting at 2.30 and one at, uh, at I believe, 2 o'clock. Um, and so I hope to see some of you there. In addition, the Mountain Partnership will be having a meeting of the members that are here this afternoon in the India Ocean Room, I, which is in this building, at 4 o'clock. So if any of you are members of the Mountain Partnership or interested in learning more, uh, please, please come along. So I wanted to provide a few brief framing remarks to set the context for this session. And I wanted to emphasize in particular three main points. The world's mountains are vitally important for global environmental sustainability. Uh, that's one. A second one is that mountain ecosystems and people are highly vulnerable to climate change, which is occurring against a wide backdrop of environmental degradation and socioeconomic marginalization of various kinds in mountains. Thirdly, I think it's important to keep in mind that these problems are solvable. The problems are grim, and I'm gonna present some troubling data, but nevertheless, with comprehensive and integrated solutions, we can move forward on addressing these issues. I think it's worth uh, reminding us a little bit on the significance of mountains uh, globally. And I think it, there's a number of key statistics that are really important to keep in mind. Firstly, they cover about 22% of the Earth's land surface. They're also home to about 950 million people, which is about 13% of the global population. Also, they host about a quarter of all terrestrial biological diversity. This is huge and they provide vital ecosystem services. Somewhere between 60 and 80% of global fresh water flows through mountains in the hydrological cycle. The frustrating thing is that while billions of people are dependent on mountains, most people don't realize it. Finally, they're economically very important. About 15 to 20% of global tourism occurs in mountains. There's vast stocks of natural resources and also extraordinary stocks of traditional knowledge that, in fact, if that information was lost, if that knowledge was lost, would be extraordinarily expensive to replace. Secondly, turning to the topic of mountain vulnerability, there's some major challenges that mountains face. One, highly relevant to this meeting, to the to COP22, is that they're amongst the hardest hit environments by climate change. Mountain water sources face threats from changing precipitation patterns, from loss of snow and ice, and from widespread degradation of environmental services. Another issue that has received minimal attention is something that I call the cold climate barrier that has kept plant and animal pathogens at bay 
It's going to collapse. We're going to have very serious problems in the future with uh, zoonotic and plant diseases and so on affecting people and ecosystems. Further, another cause for considerable concern is that mountain people are amongst the world's most food insecure. A recent uh, FAO Mountain Partnership study indicated that the number of mountain people vulnerable to food insecurity has increased by 30% in the last decade, 30%. It's gotten 30% worse, reaching almost 320 million people. Ironically, during the same period, global food insecurity has been reduced by about 160 million around the world. The news in general is getting better. The mountains have clearly been forgotten in these strategies. Today, about 40% of the food insecure people in the world are living in mountains. I'm particularly struck that SDG2, which is related to hunger, makes absolutely no mention of mountains, and I think there's some serious neglect there. Another consequence of these and other challenges is that about half of conflicts today, at any given point in time in general, occur in mountain regions. And this is, this is in part a consequence of these and many other challenges that I haven't reviewed so far. We are delighted that mountains have gained significant recognition at the target level within the SDGs, for instance. SDG 6, related to water, has a specific mountain target. Um, and SDG 15, related to terrestrial ecosystems and biodiversity, mountains are covered under a couple of targets there as well. Further, the community of nations involved in climate change and so on, um, it's uplifting to see that 48 of the NDCs that have been presented do make specific mention of mountains, and that provides an important opening. But these accomplishments don't go far enough. Recent efforts to get recognition of mountain issues under the UNFCC have not particularly borne fruit. Uh, there's, we've been pushing hard for an IPCC special report, um, ineffectually so far, and it really remains to be seen how effective mountain issues will be taken into account in the NDCs, national adaptation plans, et cetera, at national levels, but also how they'll be implemented locally. At a meeting in May in New York, senior UN staff stressed to us that the relevance of mountains needs specific assessment across all the SDGs if we're going to be successful in meeting the goals. I could go on. Um, another issue I think is of concern is that mountain civil society uh, nor indigenous people have sufficiently mobilized to ensure that mountain regions get the attention that they need. Our speakers will now provide broad perspectives on the global context and how mountains are being impacted by climate change. Then we will cover a range of national to local perspectives on um, responses to climate change and then we'll have some closing thoughts from FAO. So in the interest of efficiency, I will ask our first speaker, uh, the Secretary General of the World uh, Meteorological Organization, Petri Talas, to present on climate change in mountain areas, projection and impacts. And thank you very much for coming to the event and for your time. So, yes, please. Thanks. Thank you and thanks for the invitation. I'm, I'm sure that somebody's operating the There's slides a... for me. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So speak from there. I think if you can speak from okay. there, just be okay. more efficient. Okay, so I'm speaking from here. So uh, th thanks for uh, for inviting me here, and uh, and thanks for coming to this side uh, event. Uh, I'm also watching uh, the, the highest mountain of, of Europe from my window, both in my office and uh, also from my home in Geneva. So uh, this, uh, I'm, I'm watching this melting of the glaciers of. Uh, of Mont Blanc area uh, on, on daily basis, so I'm, I'm also aware of uh, what's happening there. And uh, and from WMO's side, I'm happy to report you what uh, what we know, uh, what are the impacts of uh, climate change uh, in, the, in the future, and uh, what we have been observing so far, and, and what kind of uh, services we can provide uh, to assist the, the mountain countries in this field. So WMO is a uh, UN specialized agency on, on, on weather, climate and, and, and water and uh, we have uh, almost all of the UN members are members of WMO and, and we hope to get uh, have some discussions on, on a new member even today and uh, we are located in, in, in Geneva. 
And besides the secretariat that we have in, in Geneva, we have also around 5,000 national experts who are who are doing a very large fraction of our, our, our work. We have uh, national meteorological and hydrological services at the, all of the uh, me member countries, and, and they are very much uh, contributing to, to our work, and as well as uh, academic uh, in institutions. And uh, we are partly uh, uh, the, the organization which is responsible for this COP uh, process. Uh, we, all, we have organized uh, both the first climate uh, conference in the world, uh, and that led to the establishment of IPCC, and the uh, second one led to establishment of uh, this UN, uh, UNFCCC. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and of course, Paris Agreement is also important uh, for our community, and, uh, and we are facing the impacts of uh, climate change on our everyday work, and, uh, for example, in, in, the, in the amount of uh, disasters which seems to be growing at the moment. And uh, uh, we have a decision-making body called Congress, which meets every, every four years, where all the member countries are present. And uh, they have decided to have uh, seven priorities for the coming, for this uh, financial period. And one of them is related to uh, polar and high mountain areas. So this is, uh, this is a high pri a priority area also for, for WMO. And why these mountain areas are, are important, uh, the chair of the meeting already told, told, told us uh, several things. Uh, it's, uh, it's for many countries, it's a, it's a main source of uh, fresh water, and, and that's one of the matters of concern behind uh, climate change. What's going to happen to those, uh, those water resources in the, in, 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 in the future? And of course, there are people living in the mountain areas, and, uh, and there are plenty of uh, economic activities and also biological uh, features. And uh, for weather, uh, these mountains are, we call them disturbance to our weather systems. And, and uh, for example, these low pressure areas, they, they get their origin uh, from, from, from the mountains. Uh, these rocky mountains, for example, they are causing, causing these uh, rainfall events in, in, in European countries. The low pressure systems get to have their origins uh, from, from, from them. And in a smaller scale, we have also this fern event, uh, event uh, Monsoons are, are based on, on, on this, this orography and, uh, and, and they are also important for hydrological cycle and, 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 and of course the microclimates, they are, they, they are very, very special. Also in my home country, Switzerland, uh, that's, that's the case. At the... Climate change uh, is also faced in the mountain areas and uh, as, as you all know, uh, the mountain glaciers are, are, are melting and uh, and if uh, there's, there's a graph showing what, has, what we have been observing since the, since the, since the 40s and, uh, and all of the mountain glaciers worldwide, they are retreating and, and we are lo losing this mass. And, and that's bad news for the, for the countries uh, uh, and, and, uh, and areas which have uh, where the freshwater uh, sources are coming from the mountain, mountain areas. Uh, when these uh, glaciers are melting, we are getting less uh, water to the rivers, and, and that's uh, bad for the agriculture, it's uh, for, for human well-being, and uh, in some cases also for the, for the, for the industries. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, this uh, climate change is, uh, is uh, happening at the higher speed in, in the mountain areas than, than elsewhere, because of, of, of the amplifying effect of uh, melting of uh, snow, and, snow and ice. And, and the same is happening also in the Arctic area, and, uh, and that's why we have seen the highest uh, temperature changes taking place in the in the in, 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 in the Arctic, and uh, and globally we expect to see warming uh, ranging from 1.5 degree, which is the magic uh, number uh, which was agreed last year in Paris, uh, up to 4.5 degrees. And if we are not going to do anything, we could see uh, eight degrees a warmer planet, which would persist for for thousands of years. And that's why it's important that we are successful uh, with, uh, with with this COP. Uh, of uh, processes. And, uh, and, and there are also natural uh, hazards related to, to the mountain, mountain areas, and, uh, and it's, it's all, not only this uh, shortage of uh, water resources, but, uh, but we can have also flooding. And uh, for example, in the Himalayan area, there's now big fear in countries like Nepal and Bhutan that this melting of, uh, of Himalayan glaciers le le leads to severe flooding in, 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 in their countries. And, and that's, a, that, that's a threat uh, uh, in the capital of Nepal. 
for example. And, and also this drought uh, issue is, is, is a serious uh, one and, uh, and, and uh, in some cases this permafrost melting is a uh, threat to the constructed uh, infrastructures. And, and here are some examples from uh, Pyrenees, for example, we have seen how was the glacier in, uh, how, more than 100 years ago and how, how it was a few, few years ago. And, and we have such uh, exa examples from all over the world. And um, how about the future scenarios? Uh, uh, here we have this uh, worst case IPCC scenario where uh, we are not able to uh, mitigate, uh, where we, we will continue just emitting as, as we have been doing so far and you can see that in many mountain areas we expect to see more rainfall and that's the case for example in the in the Himalayan area and, and, and also in the in, in the Arctic areas and uh, some parts of Andean mountains but there are also areas where we expect to see less rainfall and that's uh, that's hitting uh, countries like Morocco, Spain, France and, 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 and this Mediterranean region in, in, in general. And also in southern part of, uh, of Africa, you can see uh, brown color, which indicates that there will be less, uh, less rainfall. And uh, what, what's going to happen to the, to the uh, 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 water resources? Uh, uh, as, as, as our chair just said, uh, most of our world's uh, drinking water comes from uh, rivers and reservoirs. And, uh, and the mountain, uh, mountain regions contribute uh, from 40 to 95 percent of these uh, of the water in, the, in, in, in those uh, those rivers. And, uh, and and we are going to see more runoff in the uh, in, in, in the rivers. And actually, that's what we have been observing, for example, in all of the Arctic rivers uh, so far. And, and and the snow is melting now earlier, and, and we have less uh, runoff in, in, in summer summertime. And uh, from WMO's side, we are also supporting adaptation strategies because uh, besides mit mitigation, it's, it's important to pay attention to, to adaptation. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and this kind of early warning services and, and climate services, they are very, and, and, uh, and from our perspective, it's important to invest in the in, in international meteorological and hydrological services, which are key, key players in, in, in that field. And we have also a special uh, uh, working group uh, by our executive council on, on, on these high mountains and, uh, and, 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 and polar, polar regions. And we have a specific uh, program for this uh, global cryosphere, which is very much uh, observing, observing system. And, and then we are cooperating with other, other players and also with, with my friend uh, next to me with the FAO. We have, uh, we have quite uh, nice uh, cooperation relationship. And, uh, and, and then we, have, uh, we are pro producing a white paper on adaptation and resi resilience and, uh, and, and you can see uh, what is the role of, uh, of, of, of these mountain areas on, on hydrological cycle and it's also important for the, for the global energy production. And we are paying attention to the observations and, and we have a dedicated program for, for, for that and, uh, and also, also uh, for example in northern Spain we have uh, we have paid attention to that, and uh, there are new observing systems uh, available as part of our Cryonet uh, program. So to, to conclude, uh, we are uh, ha happy to provide uh, decision makers information on weather, <coughs> water, and climate issues, and and they are they are key for the adaptation, and and, and they are also key for the for the mitigation. And, and we have uh, we are assisting countries in building their climate services, and and we have this uh, this global cryosphere what's uh, what's program. I would like to stop here, and uh, and uh, if there's a chance to have some discussion, I'm happy to answer your questions later on. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, thank you for the uh, the very thorough. Uh, uh, coverage of some of the processes that are happening in mountain regions as a, as a, a much dive, uh, deeper dive into some of the issues that I touched on in my opening remarks. So uh, extremely useful. What I would like is for people to hold their questions uh, for the discussion at the end. 
So I think we'll move rather briskly through the presentation so that we have an opportunity to take advantage of perspectives, concerns, and issues that the audience may want to raise with the panelists and for the panelists to discuss uh, amongst themselves to raise issues that we don't uh, uh, adequately cover here in the formal presentation side of things. So now I think for our next uh, presentation, we'll turn to Andorra, I believe, uh, Carlos Miguel, you'll, you'll present. Uh, he's the IPCC UNFCC focal point, head of the Office of Energy and Climate Change of the Ministry of Environmental Agriculture and Sustainability. And we'll be talking about the peculiarities of European massifs in the context of climate change. So um, with that, um, please take thank, the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all of you uh, to attend this uh, side event. Uh, I would like to thank uh, also the uh, Andorra as a, uh, organiz an organiz organizer of this uh, side event uh, with uh, Pakistan and the Mountain Institute. So uh, I would like to uh, speak about the particularities of the European massives in the context of uh, climate change. And uh, I will do this presentation with uh, Idoya Arauzo uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Pyrenean Observatory of Climate Change on behalf of uh, the Pyrenees, the Alps, and the Carpathian Mountains. So uh, some of the topics have uh, already been uh, said by uh, the other speakers, but uh, what, what are mountains? Mountains uh, uh, cover uh, 22, 24% of the uh, Earth's uh, terrestrial surface. Uh, 99 countries, uh, countries having more than uh, 25 of their territories in mountain areas. We have a trouble. Yes. Okay. Better. Uh, Ninety-nine countries having more than twenty-five percent of uh, uh, of the territory in mountain areas, and uh, mountains are the the home of about twelve percent of global population. Uh, that represents about uh, nine hundred uh, 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 fifteen million people. So I have to look here. Mountains are alive because mountains uh, are natural systems, but human uh, systems too. Uh, mountains uh, uh, contribute to biodiversity. Mountains are carbon sinks because of the, the forests. Uh, mountains uh, uh, contribute to water circular regulation. And, and in respect of human systems, uh, water contributes to water supply. Uh, mountains uh, are the base of uh, a local economy, uh, an example for, for the tourism. Uh, mountains uh, provide uh, renewable energy, uh, as an example, uh, hydropower energy, and uh, are very important to uh, agriculture, uh, agriculture uh, for uh, lowlands, uh, an example for irrigation or uh, food uh, to contribute to food security. Uh, but uh, the, the information available suggests that climate change uh, may be uh, proceeding uh, more uh, rapidly, faster in mountain regions. Um, and, and that uh, will increase uh, the vulnerability of uh, mountain ecosystems, but also uh, human systems in uh, mountain regions. And that will increase uh, the, the impact uh, for, um, for uh, the economies and uh, biodiversity. So uh, a new signal uh, is probably identified. Uh, the, the temperatures in uh, mountains, uh, in the case of the Pyrenees, uh, increase 1.8 times faster than in middle uh, altitudes. Uh, critical uh, in the case of the, the water uh, supply, for example, mountains play a critical role in water uh, supply uh, because of the eager precipitations in uh, the, the eager altitudes. Uh, and secondly, uh, because they store the precipitation uh, as snow uh, for further release in, uh, for the, the lower uh, altitudes uh, with uh, cities that have uh, uh, great uh, populations uh, downstream. 
uh, but the, the mountains uh, provide uh, numerous ecosystem services too. Uh, that, that's an example. Uh, mountains are uh, ecosystems. Mountains uh, uh, provide services uh, and goods, uh, but they, they receive uh, impacts. Uh, they can provide renewable uh, sources of, uh, or of energy. Uh, agricultural, uh, agricultural, agriculture. So, sorry, uh, is very important for uh, food uh, security. Uh, snow uh, for the, the tourism sector in winter. Uh, mountains provide diversity, uh, but the, we need uh, policies uh, and we, we face uh, challenges to uh, to address the, the impacts uh, that uh, certainly will be uh, uh, present. They, they they are present today already so that's why um, we, we uh, want to, to speak about an initiative uh, that uh, took place uh, in uh, 2012 in uh, Hungary where uh, Pyrenees, Alps, Carpathians, Balkans, Caucasus and Central Asia were present in a workshop for sharing experiences on adaptation to climate change in mountain areas uh, and uh, it's uh, we created uh, the so-called Eger Group because the, the meeting were, took place in, in Eger, Hungary. Uh, Professor Talas uh, uh, presents us uh, the, um, the impacts, uh, the, the, the increasing temperatures in this uh, zone of, of Europe, where uh, are the Pyrenees uh, that have a structure uh, um, conducted by the uh, Pyrenean uh, working community uh, and the uh, Pyrenean Observatory of Climate Change that uh, integrates Andorra, the regions of uh, France and Spain. In the Alps, we have the, the Alpine Convention with Austria, Switzerland, Germany, France, Liechtenstein, Italy, Monaco, and Slovenia. And the, uh, in the Carpathians, the Carpathian Convention, with Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Serbia, Slovakia, and Ukraine. And now we will speak uh, for the, these three uh, major uh, massives in, in Europe. Uh, Isoya. Okay. Um, thank you very much also uh, to all the organizers for or inviting the um, Pyrenees Climate Change Observatory. And um, from from where I am the coordinator, and um, I will explain a little bit uh, the the observed um, impact on climate change in the Pyrenees, Alps, and Carpathians, and um, I will uh, excuse uh, the Alps, Tan Mrs. Tanya, and the Professor Zalai uh, from the Carpathians Convention to be here because. Um, they couldn't be here, but they share with us uh, some slides from the, their territories uh, as to explain to you uh, a little bit of these uh, impacts. So obviously I know better the Pyrenees, but uh, we have some slides from the other territories. And well, just to, to let you know the Pyrenees, uh, there are these uh, mountains between Spain and France uh, where Andorra is uh, based. And it has 1,772 um, geographical units. Uh, it has this extension, a population between 1.2 and 1.5 million persons, and an economy high dependent on tertiary sector uh, services, tourism, um, especially winter tourism. And there is also obvious, obviously agriculture. And the, um, the observatory, Pyrenees Climate Change Observatory, belongs to the working community of the Pyrenees, which is an, a public structure uh, composed by uh, seven members, uh, these all regions. And it's a um, regional initiative, so uh, together with the state of Andorra. And it exists since uh, 2010. And it has uh, undertaken several uh, reports and publications about the evolution of climate change in the Pyrenees and the impacts of this climate change. And uh, uh, I will go through 
the results that uh, later uh, that we have and in these uh, reports we have um, two ways uh, to work one about climatology and another one uh, about uh, impacts and on uh, socio socioeconomic uh, sectors and we have analyzed uh, uh, over 80, 85 adaptation initiatives in the Pyrenees and 18 in all over Europe uh, to to identify uh, what what which are the impacts. So in tourism, and uh, as as Mikel, Carlos Mikel said, uh, we have um, a big impact in in winter tourism. Uh, our economy is highly dependent on this uh, kind of economy and uh, we experience um, less um, precipitation or different patterns of precipitation, but uh, obviously less snow in the, in the mountains. And uh, in the agriculture, um, we have um, registers of higher CO2, which can contribute to a higher productivity, but uh, it's, um, it, it impacts also with more drugs, which is not good for, for the production. And in the forest, there is a um, change in the... Um, um, not in, we, we analyze the distribution of different species, and these species have uh, different preferences uh, by the temperature. And we are observing a Mediterrane Mediterraneanization of the Pyrenees. And in, in water, uh, we have still uh, some work to do. Uh, we know that it's a priority to, to go deep in studies and we are planning to undertake a, a project in, in water in the future. So the um, climatology group of researchers are observing, uh, have, have work in a database uh, for the whole Pyrenees, which is a huge work of cross-border cooperation between the uh, IMET, the, the Agency of Meteorological um, of Spain, the Meteo France, and other services of meteorology uh, in the Pyrenees, regional uh, services. And uh, we have already uh, the first database of um, average of temperature per month. And we can observe already uh, 0.2 degrees of increase uh, every 10 years. That means, uh, as he said, 1.58, sorry, uh, more than, than in the other region, not no mountain regions. And uh, so a higher increase than uh, in land regions. And in precipitation, we have observed uh, less um, so a decrease, but it's not um, that obvious because it's very different from the south part of the Pyrenees uh, from the north, and we can we should continue observing this this data. And in the future, we are now working in a new project about climatology to um, to go from monthly uh, average to daily uh, average and uh, also to, to make uh, regional projections uh, in the Pyrenees. Uh, for the Alps, we have a um, higher altitude, um, much more population. Uh, in the Pyrenees is 1.2, 1.5, here is 14 million inhabitants. Uh, they, uh, they are eight countries. 46% uh, of forest cover and, well, uh, a lot of uh, biodiversity uh, riches. And uh, they have a lot of tourism. They are really highly, highly dependent of, of high sky tourism and um, ski tourism. And they have these water reservoirs uh, 
as glaciers and, and they are observing these uh, drugs and glacier melting. And well, they have these all impacts in and vulnerabilities in socioeconomic sectors in farming and forest, forestry and natural hazards. I, I didn't say, but in the pin is, is also the, the, the case. And um, they, they are observing uh, over two degrees uh, of temperature increase. They have uh, also researcher groups working on, on climate and uh, they observe 50% of glacier area lost in the last century, over the last century, and 95% um, of glacier mass could be lost uh, by the next century. Uh, they are observing dry summers, waters, winters, and well, higher risk of extreme weather events, and uh, main energy users in the Alps, transport, and, and heating. Let's go to the Carpathians now. Um, we have this whole area and uh, approximately the territory of Spain. It's a big, a huge area. We have no data of population, but let's go to the um, administrative borders. Uh, sorry, uh, about the context in the Carpathians. Uh, is the... Um, habitat of the largest European population of brown bears, wolves, a lot of biodiversity in fawn and uh, flora, and um, is the second largest surface of virgin forest in Europe after Russia. So, They are working also uh, about uh, observing this um, temperature increase. We have this uh, cartography of uh, increase of temperature and we can observe over uh, an increase of over 1.6 degree. And thank you to this uh, project uh, with European funds, Carpat Clean and for the Carpathians, it's all. <laughs> Thank you. Only two slides uh, that will be uh, presented very fast. Yeah. Um, so the, the, that's why uh, Andorra with uh, Bhutan, Italy, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, sorry, Liechtenstein, Nepal, Switzerland, Tajikistan, and Afghanistan presented this year a special report, a, pro a proposal of, uh, for a special report uh, to IPCC on climate change and, and mountains. Uh, that was uh, discussed in the plenary of the IPCC uh, 43 in Nairobi this year, but um, only three uh, special reports were uh, uh, considered. One of uh, them uh, about the impacts of uh, global warming of uh, 1.5 uh, uh, degree uh, Celsius degrees. Uh, the other one uh, on oceans and geosphere, and the third about the certification, land degradation, sustainable land management, food security, and greenhouse gas uh, fluxes. Uh, so uh, that's why we have to work uh, that uh, in increase the visibility of the mountains in uh, the frame of uh, these three reports, all of us. Uh, so uh, we have, um, have to uh, increase this visibility in, in this uh, frame. Uh, and uh, in conclusions, mountains have uh, key relevance for policy making in sectors including energy, agriculture, tourism, uh, urbanization, and mi uh, migration, as we have uh, seen. The weak exposure and sensitivity uh, of this fragility and often marginally were already recognized. Uh, here are some references. And they are very, uh, highly relevant for the 2015 Sustainable De Development Goals of uh, UN. And uh, it, it, it's obvious that uh, mountains have been chronically underrepresented in the global observing system, uh, and they're hiding an, our ability to characterize accurately key parameters such as temperature and precipitations, as well as their rates of change. Uh, so uh, let's think about it and the impact of climate change in mountain areas must be a priority for uh, global actions. Thank you for your attention. Uh, 
Thank, thank you very much, much indeed, for a very interesting presentation. And, and it's uh, very nice to see how the panel's pro uh, progressing. I mean, I tried to provide a few broad overbrush uh, issues, and then we've had a uh, really uh, broad overview of issues going on in terms of mountains around the world, and you've di dived deep into particular issues in a couple of regions, and at the same time showed a really wonderful example of working together across multiple countries to address the challenges of climate change, and then brought it back to um, the IPCC report. Uh, again, me figuring out how we need to raise the profile of these issues. So uh, thank you very much, much indeed. Um, so I think for our next presentation, in fact, we won't have a presentation, but we'll have a film. And uh, Pakistan's mountain landscapes are so extraordinary. I'm looking forward to, to it. So, um, so Farsana Shah, the Director General of the, of the uh, Pakistan Environmental Protection Agency is going to be setting up our film here. She's our IT person at the moment, as you can see. Uh, thank, thank you. Want to say a few words to kind of introduce Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, thank you. Try to keep it 10 yeah, minutes yeah. if you can. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Andrew. Yes. Uh, yeah. First of all, on behalf of uh, my minister, Mr. Zaid Ahmed, uh, Minister for Climate Change, Ministry of uh, Climate Change Pakistan, and Mr. Rizwan Mebu, who was supposed to be here, but uh, they were supposed to be here in, for this session, but uh, unfortunately, due to the delay in the flight, they couldn't make to reach here. So uh, on their behalf, I attend this session and offer the congratulations to all partners over here and Institute of the Mountains to uh, arrange this uh, event and to make Thank the COP successful. Thank you. Uh, I will show a short documentary about the Pakistan uh, you can see about geomorphology and the climatic condition in the Pakistan right from the mountain till the desert area we have in Pakistan. Thank you. Thanks. Winter in Malod is harsh and unforgiving, and life seemed to be at a standstill. But people here have their own needs to keep things alive. The harsh weathers here have made the community strong and persevering. Thank you. 
it's the month of March. Ganga Choti, the tallest peak in the foothills of the Himalayas of district Bagh, Azad, Kashmir, receives a hefty amount of snow. The fragile ecosystem of the area is experiencing the stress from the untimely snowfall. The blanket of snow would fall back to reveal the colors and flowers would blossom to mark the end of bloom. इस मौसम में लोग मालियों पे जाते थे हरियाली होती थी जंगल में अभी तक बर्फ जो है वो नहीं पिघली है बेमौसमी बारिशें हैं बेमौसमी बर्फ है इतनी मौसम में तब्दीली है लाइक अकबर खान समवन एल्स हैज आल्सो फेल्ट दिस चेंजेस 200 किलोमीटर साउथवर्ड्स हियर एट फायलेआजम यूनिवर्सिटी इन इस्लामाबाद Salma is doing research on the issue of climate changes in her native area of District Ba. The Ba district is witnessing severe changes. Nala Mal is one of the tributaries of River Jhelum and has a vast catchment area. The untimely and torrential rains of 2010 caused daunting floods of historical proportions, along with unprecedented levels of landsliding and land erosion of the kind the area has never witnessed before. When the water receded, it left its mark of destruction and hundreds of stories untold. हमें जो नुकसान पड़ा है ये नाला माल वाले जो है ना इसमें ज़्यादा नुकसान दिए हमको जब पता चला कि नाला हमारे इधर फार है तो हमने मकान का खाली करना शुरू किया हम यहाँ से बच्चों को लेके भाग गए तो सुबह के आठ नौ बजे के दिन तो नाले ने कटाई शुरू कर दी हमारे चार पांच दुकान थे यहाँ पे वो भी सारे जो है नाले में बुर्द हो गए
makes me a bit sad to cut this quite beautiful film off midstream, but I wanted to kind of work through our schedule and so that we've got some time for discussions uh, towards the end. Um, so I think if you've got a link for this so that people can perhaps see it later, that sure. would be that would be wonderful. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, and uh, then I would encourage people, but it's sort of the film and so it reminds me about both why mountains are so inspirational to so many of us, but it's also nice to see science and action communities and a real effort to address some of the issues there. So uh, I encourage you to come back to, to look at this uh, film and we'll through the Mountain Partnership. Andrew, I can the share with the participant over here. Uh, this video we are playing in our Pakistan pavilion, in pavilion four, you can visit any time. And we have uh, on the USB as well over there. So if you are interested, you can get the copy. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And again, very sorry to cut to, yeah, no. to cut you off partway through it. Um, so I think we'll now go on to uh, Colombia, uh, where uh, Colombia uh, Camila Rodriguez Vargas will, from the uh, Directorate for Climate Change of the Ministry of Environment, will be presenting on adaptation to climate impacts in water regulation supply. <laughs> Uh, for the areas Tingasa, Sumapaz, and Guerrero. Adelante. Well, thank you very much, uh, first for to the government of Andorra and the Mountain Institute for inviting Colombia to this event. And thank you all of you for participating uh, today. Um, <laughs> Where, uh, well, I actually worked in the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development in Colombia. Um, in information for adaptation and mitigation issues, and I've been supporting some of the some of the adaptation projects in the country. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um. <laughs> Sorry for this yeah, technology no issues. <laughs> so, um, I think it's not working. Oh, yeah. I will give you some of context uh, about Colombian institutionality and about um, the ways that we have been working on climate change for the last few years. So uh, in Colombia, we have a national climate change policy that includes uh, three main strategies, national strategies. The uh, low development carbon uh, strategy uh, for the country, the national adaptation plan, and the red uh, strategy. Thank you. And under these national strategies, uh, we have been developing some sectorial plans and territorial plans uh, for mitigation and adaptation. We have been working in eight uh, action uh, sectorial plans for adaptation. And uh, under these sectorial plans and territorial plans, we have uh, some mitigation and adaptation programs and projects that have been implementing in the country. Also, we have the National Climate Change uh, System that is uh, like a cross-carrying institution uh, that was created this year, actually, um, to manage in a cross-carrying way, like inviting all the ministries uh, to a meeting, annual meeting, uh, to agree how it's going to be um, like the drivers about uh, the national strategies for climate change. And in our NDC, we have um, 
mitigation issues, uh, like 20% uh, reduction for 2030. We have um, some issues about adaptation, about uh, to have 100% of the territory with national adaptation plans in an imp in implementation stage, and some uh, things about means of implementation. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So our uh, adaptation national uh, plan has a general objective to reduce risk and socioeconomic impacts associated with to variability and climate change. And under our uh, under the PENAC, we have uh, four national institutions coordination the implementation of actions in the territorial way and sectoral way. The National Planning Department, the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development, the Institute of Hydrological, Meteorological and Environmental Studies, and the National Unit for Disaster Risk uh, Management. So this is how it looks like, the map of Colombia and the percentage of the territory that we have already covered with adaptation plans uh, that you see in colors. We have around uh, 16 adaptation uh, territorial plans for the country. And uh, we have also some uh, six um, sectors with the mandate to develop and to implement the sect their sectorial adaptation plans, agriculture, energy, tourism, transport, health, and housing. Under the national uh, adaptation plan, we have uh, these five main streams, uh, and we and I'm going to talk about uh, the last ones um, that have been uh, under we and under the ones that we have been implementing some ecosystem-based adaptation projects. So about um, high mountain ecosystems, we have. Um, Bogota, that is the capital of Colombia, and all the 100% of the drinking water uh, for Bogota, that is a city of 8 million people, more or less, uh, came from the complex of uh, Chingaza, Sumapaz, and Guerrero. These are some uh, paramount wetlands areas that we have around Bogota. Uh, right into the, into the Andes um, mountains. So uh, we have been uh, working on some uh, projects for, impl for in the implementation of some projects in these areas because of the importance of the ecosystem services that uh, they represent for the area of Bogota and, and the region of uh, Cundinamarca. Uh, and these projects are the INAP uh, that was implemented between 2006 and 2010. Uh, the regional plan for climate change uh, for this region uh, from 2012 um, until now. And the Chingasa Suma Paz Guerrero project uh, from 2013 and 2017. The INAP had uh, four main strategies about restoration and conservation, about land use planning and improvement of climate change information and farming systems. This is why uh, people in these areas. Uh, they have a lot of problems with, uh, with uh, about uh, water supply, about informal land tenure dynamics, uh, because of the like they have some uh, dynamics that are not. I'm not. I'm not going to say illegal, but uh, they are always like the land is always divided and divided uh, one and over generation, one and one to another generation. So, um, and a lot of biodiversity and ecosystems uh, impacts because of climate change and climate variability. Uh, this is why we formulate this project 
that was that has these uh, four main uh, line streams, and uh, it was implemented uh, with the coordination of a lot of local and national institutions, <coughs> as you see below. So we have uh, the second one project that is the Regional Comprehensive Plan of Climate Change of the Bogota Cundinamarca Capital Region, uh, and it is an a strategic interagency partnership for the implementation of the territorial approach. I think this is one of the most important elements of this project and the main uh, lessons we learned from here were about uh, the importance of multi-stakeholder planning processes. Um, we made some climate change physical impact and vulnerability scenarios. And uh, we designed and began with the implementation with some uh, strategic options or actions about mitigation and adaptation for this region. Uh, we were discussing always, uh, uh, discussing uh, to be with the national institutions and the local institutions about the policies and finances and financing options to implement these actions. And the third one is the adaptation to climate change, to climate impacts in water regulation and supply for the area of Chingaza Suma Pass, Guerrero. Uh, this project uh, began in 2013, and I think it has the possibility, it, it was the possibility, it had the possibility to recognize all the lessons learned about uh, from the other projects, from the previous one and uh, had a better design and development and implementation of the strategies. Uh, so like I was mentioned before, uh, the institutional strength and the working with people is one of the most important lessons from the two, uh, pro the two other projects. And this project um, is providing actually support for the implementation of adaptation measures. Um, and it has two main strategies too about uh, strengthening uh, climate information and have um, some projects with um, productive uh, activities with people and um, reservation and conservation strategies. So um, about concluding remarks, and next steps. I think that the current analysis of projects that have, uh, have established a root initiatives, as I described, creating a continuing effort in order to reduce vulnerability and high mountain ecosystems and paramus and increase local resilience. Uh, also consolidate institutional frameworks and capacities for joint action on mitigation and adaptation to climate change in national and subnational levels is crucial for the sustainability and appropriation of the projects and actions. Uh, we have been uh, working a lot with the communities of these areas. And one of the most important things we did with these kinds of, these kinds of projects is that once you have a project, a, an implementation of a project there, and then the project uh, leaves, you need to uh, secure that the implementation is going to be, that there is a going, um, there is a going to uh, be a sustainable implementation um, and appropriation of these uh, actions. Otherwise, you will have like a lot of efforts just lose. And join the first and exchange experiences among countries and agencies to replicate and scale progress. The strengthen on the strengthen of uh, institutional, national, and local institutions of, around climate change implementation of actions is uh, a crucial issue that we all have to be into account here. And uh, the importance of uh, this, the exchange experiences and the joint efforts among agencies and among all our countries that have the same uh, ecosystems, um, the same ecosystem areas and same uh, problems. So that's it. this is why we have uh, on the 6th and 7th on December of this year, an international summit about Paramos in Colombia. It will be great to have you there and exchange some experiences and maybe account with some experts. 
And all this meeting and work agenda of Andean Initiative for the Mountains in 2017, I think it is a very important issue to continue our work. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the presentation. Uh, so I think in the interest of uh, getting through the remainder of the program, uh, it's my great pleasure uh, now uh, to uh, introduce uh, my uh, vice chair for the Mountain Partnerships, uh, Graminos Mastrogeni from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Italy. And the podium is yours. Here. It's mine, but I have to. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, actually, didn't put in the slides because uh, I got lost. I couldn't find the. Uh, the, this room, but even if I didn't manage at all to to arrive, it would it wouldn't have been very uh, a very bad thing because my point has already been made. Mountains are but in all the climate change debate, as in many other debates, and uh, I think this is an opportunity to cry out. Italy has been a founding member of the Mountain Partnership and is currently financing a, a great part of it. And it comes in a framework, in a logic. Uh, some time ago, we decided that we would devote our environmental cooperation to fragile ecosystems. Not all of them. For instance, we do not uh, work in the Arctic, unfortunately. Uh, but mainly drylands, islands, and mountains. Islands managed to put their point on the agenda, and I'm very happy about that. Drylands are getting more and more important. Mountains are being not perceived as important elements of a global stake. And this is what I would like to briefly go through. Uh, there is some wicked coincidence. It is not an, an absolute truth, but it is there to see. There is an overlapping of the maps of where climate change has more severe impacts and areas where socioeconomic fragility pre-existed. This is true for deserts, it's true for islands, and it is true for mountains. One easy and cynical reaction to this could be just to say, well, these are marginal areas. It's Italy, it's easy to migrate from there. And uh, in a way, we have so many stakes in front of us. Should we concentrate means on marginal areas like mountains or drylands? This way of thinking, besides being unethical, is uh, deeply uh, dysfunctional because we tend to forget that our marvelous balance which we call planet earth and its ecosystem hosts all sorts of presences both animated and inanimated but all of them do not only have a presence in the ecosystem they also have a function serving the functioning of all the rest and this is what we are forgetting about mountains now we have a wonderful framework frame to start rethinking about that, which is the 2030 Agenda. The 2030 Agenda is a leap forward in thinking about development and in thinking about the environment, not only because it qualifies our development objectives as sustainable, but because it embodies a great intuition. If you look at this uh, table, it is not by chance, maybe not intentionally, but not by chance, that it is portrayed as a series of small cases. It looks a little bit like a mathematical instrument. It looks like a matrix. If this was only 
a list of objectives. They could just be one beside the other in any possible form. But they've been put together in the form of a matrix. It means that there are functions that connect each case to the other case. And that tell us that according to the changing of a value in one case, all the other values will change. And there is another feature about this agenda, which is even more extraordinary, that is uh, uh, leading us to think things in a totally different way. Uh, one temptation would be to, to say, if we thought the old way, that these objectives have to be managed with limited resources, so that there is a competition between among all these objectives. If I have 100 million and I have two objectives, uh, like zero hunger and good health, well, there's a problem. I have to allocate half of it to one and half of it to the other one. This agenda is making us realize that you cannot have good health without good nutrition, and you cannot have good nutrition without good health. So this agenda is telling us that if we manage all the elements of our wonderful balance that we call ecosystem and of which we are part correctly, we are actually act acting positively on behalf of everything. This agenda empowers us to identify items which are essential in the balance, to leverage their uh, potential, and then have all the results reflected on everything. We could simplify this agenda just uh, bringing it back to these four cases, uh, this four cases matrix that put together in a dynamic relationship, environmental stress, peace and stability, economic development, and human rights. What does it mean? It might mean a lot of things, but it basically means that the environment is not all important for the environment. The environment is important for us. And it is in this light that I would like to stress how important mountains are for all of us and how, in comparison, they are neglected in the debate and send out a call to really step up your voices and ask for mountains to be more in the agenda. Uh, there is a small community that is also at work in the SCOP that takes care of climate and fragility. We, have, uh, we are having meetings uh, in the framework of G7 on that, for example. It means what is the relationship between climate change and uh, peace? Some uh, scholars have uh, analyzed uh, various implications of climate change on peace and security, and uh, there is one scenario among these that have been considered by the way, there are 78 ongoing conflicts that are considered as having climate change as their causes. But there is one nightmare scenario. It's called the Himalaya scenario. Uh, the uh, meteorological and climate uh, projections on, uh, on the Himalaya have already been uh, depicted with much more competence uh, than, uh, than I could by uh, WMO. But to make a long story short, mountains host glaciers. Mountains have a presence in the ecosystem. Glaciers also have a presence in the ecosystem, but it's not only a presence. They also have a, a function. It is forecasted that Himalayan glaciers, just as much as glaciers are on the, uh, the mountain chains around the world, will melt. It will not probably happen in a gradual way, proportionally with increases in temperature. There are thresholds, phenomena, nonlinear impacts. Uh, if I understood it correctly, at a certain point, the melting of the glaciers will be superficial. There will be liquid water which will trickle down to the bases of the glaciers, and this will lubricate the parts where they are anchored on the mountains, which is already happening in Greenland, by the way, with another proportion. And so there is a risk of quick collapse of glaciers. If this happens in a region like this, it means that water output will be disrupted, not only because there are landslides and this kind of things. It means that in a monsoonic climate, and I can be punished for being imprecise by Nabriamo, uh, in a climate like that, we risk a very quick uh, switch 
from a climate in which glaciers were regu are regulating the output of waters to the valleys during the dry season to a climate in which disastrous floods will be matched by disastrous droughts. It means that agriculture, not only agriculture, also infrastructure, social cohesion goes into a total short circuit. If it happens quickly and populations around there do not have the time to adapt, it's going to be a big, big problem. Now, I don't want to be tragic, but just to get an idea of what this community of uh, climate and geostrategy thinkers are considering is, uh, if you think that the Second World War was now recognizably triggered by economic pressures on populations that lead them to irrational behaviors. And if you think that in this area, there are two billion people who could be deeply affected and immediately affected by such a, a switch in a scenario. I wouldn't like to add even the fact that in this region, four states have atom bombs. This is science fiction, but, but we have a notion of the stakes that the health of mountains represent for the rest of our communities. It is just an example, but it is part of uh, a cycle. We have to stop everywhere, especially, especially in fragile ecosystem where they overlap with fragile society. Environmental stress causes social cohesion, collapse and conflict. This induces a loss of mitigation and adaptation cap capability in those areas, and this will lead to more environmental stress. We are acting this way, that the international community is acting this way towards silence, towards dryland. Now it's the turn of mountains. Mountains occupy a big portion of the earth. They are absolutely essential for a balanced ecosystem, not only where they are, but also in the valleys, because valleys benefit from healthy ecosystems there. With one last point, there is another temptation. That is to say that Nature will make its better course if mankind goes away. But in mountains, story has been so that sound ecosystems have been shaped by a human presence and not any human presence. It's a human presence that has shaped in turn its own habits and uh, ways to relate to the territory through thousands of years of experience and uh, wisdom. It is through them that we need to start protecting mountains. And in order to do that, we need to raise voice for the mountains. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. I mean, for really quite an inspiring and important uh, uh, presentation. So it's now my, my uh, honor to ask uh, Martin Freak from the Director of Climate Change at FAO to provide some additional remarks uh, on promoting mountains, climate change agenda, and so on. So please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. No, I don't have a presentation and I shall be very brief. You've been listening patiently and I can imagine that you have some questions. And additionally, um, it just so happens that I quite often sit on the panel with my friend Kraminos and we are brothers in mind. And he said many things that I wanted to say and that are dear to me. Most importantly, the interdependence of all of the SDGs and the need for system thinking. And when I was walking this morning to the COP premises and I've seen the snow of the mountains, well, there's a relationship to my morning shower. It's as simple as that. You just need to connect it. Water is the most important thing for agriculture and um, more than 70% of water worldwide is used in agriculture and in countries like Morocco, this number is easily exceeding 85, 90%, which really goes into agriculture. Agriculture is, of course, what provides you food. So without water, no food. But the chain also goes in a different direction. Because without sustainable agriculture, there is no sustainable water supply. And this is particularly true in mountainous areas. Last year at COP21, I had the pleasure to be in a similar side event. And we had just um, finished the study in which we said that a shocking one out of three in mountain populations is suffering hunger. So we know about um, trilands and we know about small islands as specific areas where climate change hits hardest, but we are not so well aware 
about mountains. So there is a big um, advocacy and awareness raising aspect to that, but there is also concrete action that can be done. Um, we have a whole range of different activities <laughs> in the negotiations, and I note with quite some satisfaction that we went a long way last year with the Paris Agreement that was mentioning food security in the preambula, and now there is still negotiating around um, the substar conclusions for agriculture, and I would highly recommend um, to push for language on mountains here, because if we are going for a systems approach, we cannot simply ignore mountains for all the good reasons that the other um, excellent panelists have mentioned um, before. And if it's only for one thing, if you look at snow and ice, this is the water battery of this planet. And once this battery is empty, we got a double problem because upstream there is no more water coming, but downstream the water is not bound. And if you take heat and water together in a closed system, well, do not be surprised if you have more extreme weather events. And I hope I see my neighbor nodding, I do, because he understands so much more about meteorology um, than I'm doing. Um, let me just say, um, we did a deep dive analysis of the nationally determined contributions and they basically show overwhelmingly a commitment to adaptation in agriculture and also to mitigation in agriculture. Actually, both from basically all countries in the world. So this is, I think, one of the first effects of the sustainable development goals that you do not see in our South divide. We are all in this together. Um, however, many of the NDCs were done um, by a small group of experts, often in a rush. We have to get that into the whole of national planning. And again, I would very much encourage you to work nationally and to make the case to include mountains into the national responses um, to the climate change challenge. Last not least, um, there is... Um, expertise available. There are many, many tools in the scientific world and within my organization, FAO, and there is also money available. It's just that we need to connect the dots and basically funnel climate money where it is needed. And um, we have a very strong case to work in mountainous areas, on reforestation, on mountain food systems. Let me conclude um, with one sentence, which I repeat again and again and again. I think it's so important. I think the most important change we need, that's true for farmers worldwide, that's particularly true for mountain farmers, is a change in how we look at these people. Um, they are not only people who produce food and make an income by producing food. They are key agents to keep our global ecosystems working. And this is a global interest, I would say, like no other interest. So we need to honor what people are doing on a piece of land and have to work that they work sustainably to keep the ecosystems in place because the best adaptation measures is really when we work in synergy with nature. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, uh, for, for the, the very cogent comments. Before opening up to, up to questions, I wanted to say just one last thing, and I wanted to bring it back to mountain people. Mountain communities, and certainly in my experience, are some of the world's most inherently resilient peoples on the planet. They've had to be because they live in an extraordinarily tough environment. Indigenous and people in particular have wonderful lessons for all of us, and I'm simply amazed by how mountain women cope with very difficult circumstances today. Through approaches like ecosystem-based adaptation, climate smart agriculture, the things that Martin has just mentioned, integrating science with traditional knowledge, we are finding solutions that improve livelihoods of the most impoverished while decreasing climate change vulnerability. There really are pathways to green prosperity for mountain communities that will benefit everyone if comprehensive solutions can be found. The challenge is for the policy community to come through and we've got massive ones. So with that final note, um, we've got Three minutes for questions, comments, so please, the audience. Uh, Christina and then uh, colleague in the back of the room. Uh, can, you, can you yell it or, I'm sorry. I'll try to repeat it if I can hear.
Thank you very much. Uh, Christina, do you have a comment? Or if you want to come up to the microphone, it's it's very hard to hear. But uh, the last comment was commenting on on a uh, uh, on, on Isimat's program um, in uh, in the Himalayas. I encourage you to talk with our colleague, and they have a booth here because they're, they're doing the amazing research in that region. Please. Uh, yeah. Just come take one of these. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, I'm Christina Swiderska from IIED. Uh, I'm going to kneel down, <laughs> make it easier. But I really appreciate um, the emphasis on sustainable agriculture. Um, sorry, on the need for sustainable agriculture in mountains. Um, and I'd like to um, stress that sustainable agriculture and agroecology um, the practices for that come very much from indigenous knowledge and indigenous peoples in mountains and traditional farmers in mountains are a tremendous resource for um, sustainable agriculture. And unfortunately, um, there's a lot of rapid change going on and genetic resources, crop diversity and so on are being lost quite quickly. And national agriculture research and extension systems don't really distinguish between uh, promoting monocultures on agricultural be bread belts and in more fragile environments like mountains. And we're seeing a really quite rapid erosion of genetic diversity in mountains through the spread of monocultures, which may be great, you know, for a year or two. But the, the thing about climate change is there's increasing variability and unpredictability. And, you know, these farmers will have nothing to fall back on when the climate changes again. So I think we really do need to rethink the concept of climate smart agriculture when it comes to mountains and make sure we're talking about genetic diversity and indigenous knowledge in that context. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I fear we've run over, but if anybody in the audience, um, well, actually, actually, I think you had a question. Maybe, maybe we can just take two more until we're thrown out. A question or, or a comment? Yeah, I think it's better. Uh, hello, good afternoon. My name is Robert Hofstede, Climate Change Director at IDOC, and happen to be at the moment also the chair of the Mountain Forum. So we've been listening during several uh, events about the, climate, the mountain agenda and how, it, uh, how important it is. Also a little bit how it evolved. We, you were mentioning by uh, new relevance, the SDGs, and how the mountain agenda links into the SDGs. Now, with the risk that it has been told, because I haven't got seen the whole event, we also just have accepted the new urban agenda at Habitat 3. Um, is there, has the mountain agenda involved to be looking a little bit from the rural area towards the mountain cities or the mountain affected cities or the link between the rural urban connection on that level that would be my question how that's being like a new page in the long book of the mountain history included i'm not sure if any of the panels want to take on i mean i'm chair of the mountain partnership and i can certainly say that urban issues are things that we certainly discuss i mean i think it's a much larger issue which is to get the mountain agenda to really take off and i think that's it's still kind of on the launch pad and so uh, i think the urban issues need to be on the launch pad with the other ones as well but other other panelists. I mean, maybe I think now's the time to ask if the if any of the panelists have uh, additional words of wisdom, closing comments, please. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, uh, we have been working on this issue because it, one of the biggest problems is that you have a lot of ecosystem services that are uh, from the high mountain areas to the cities, and a lot of our big cities in in the Andean region, not that not, not just Colombia, but Peru and Ecuador, um, are in these areas, and they receive ecosystem services not just related with, with water, but with other things like food and everything. So what we are trying to do is connect these issues because, uh, for example, in in the case that I presented before. Uh, we have the uh, people of Bogota is not conscious, they, does not have this conscious about the ecosystem services that these regions around are serving to them. 
So if they do, they can begin to wonder about why it's important for them, like taking a shower and everything about these high ecosystem services. And uh, one of the problem of the uh, projects uh, that we have been working with is that they do not do this connection. They do not work with the institutions, for example, in the main cities and these areas, these round areas and national protection areas. So they have to do it to abort this uh, issue, as you asked. Uh, any other any other closing comments from the panel? Please, shortcoming. Madam from Pakistan. Uh, uh, yes. In Pakistan, in Kashmir, you know, one of the capital city of the Kashmir is the Muzaffarabad, and that is a mountain city basically. And uh, we have established a climate change research center over there, particularly dealing with the issues of the mountain area and uh, being impacted by the mountain effects. And in 2005, this city was devastated by the earthquake as well with the intensity of the 7.6. So uh, we are working a lot of research in that area. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, we are now a couple of minutes over, uh, five minutes over. Um, any other comments or we can, otherwise I'll declare the session closed. Great. Well, thank you very much for a fascinating panel and I congratulate you all on your really important work. We're having a side event tomorrow at 2.30 in the Indigenous Pavilion uh, on mountains and Indigenous knowledge. And we're going to talk about how to get mountains better recognised in the negotiations, at, um, in the climate negotiations. So you're all welcome. Thank you. I get so frustrated when this is not happening. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. That's hard. Uh, it's, it's over exciting Yeah. I really felt bad cutting this video off because it was very beautiful and, and I, I really want to do this. Well, uh, I hear, you know, Ali, you have to do this. You always struggle with the very strange. I, yeah.